Let's make one of these. Ah, who am I kidding? I don't know the first thing about making clocks. Welcome to the Mackie Makerspace. Hi, I'm Brother Bob Mackie. I am the curator of meteorites at the Vatican Observatory. Now, I heard a story once about a political prisoner kept in solitary confinement for years. And to keep his sanity, he designed a clock entirely in his mind. Now, he didn't know anything about clocks, so he had to figure it out all by himself. And when he was finally released, he actually built the thing and it worked. So I tried to search the internet for that story and I couldn't find any actual reference, but if you know something about it, please post a comment below. Anyway, I was inspired by the story. So let's design a clock from first principles. First, some ground rules. This is a learning experience, and that means some trial and error. And I hope this also inspires you to learn some of the design principles that go into something like this. Now, I am not going to bring in any outside research. And that means that whatever I come up with may or may not resemble what clockmakers actually build. And that is fine. You might already know something about building clocks, but please do not comment on the right way to do this. Or at least save those comments until the end of the series when I will compile them into a special episode with lessons learned. Now, I will almost certainly be making mistakes, and that is fine. I hope you find them entertaining. And what I come up with will probably not be elegant nor efficient, especially since I'm going to be constructing stuff with a mix of 3D printing and craft materials. Now, if you want to see expert clock making and beautiful craftsmanship, I refer you to the ClickSpring channel. There is a link below. And while I am a fan of his work, I have not studied his clock designs in any depth and I will not be referencing them here. By the way, as a side note, I encourage you to check out his entire playlist on the Antikyther mechanism. So you may have some of your own ideas about how to design some of the components or mechanisms, and I encourage you to try them out on your own and maybe even build them. At the end of the series, I will ask you to share your original designs. So let's get started. But where? A clock is a complicated mechanism with lots of interacting parts. So it'll be easier if we break it down into distinct functions and design each function in turn. So let's start simple with a few gears. The most recognizable aspect of a clock is the face with the hands that point to the hour, the minute, and the second. And these hands turn in very specific ratios. The second hand takes forward 1 60th of a circle each second. When it makes a full circle around the clock face, the minute hand will have advanced one tick mark. So the ratio of minutes to seconds is 1 to 60. And when the minute hand makes one revolution of the clock face, the hour hand advances by one hour, which is 1 12th of a circle. So the ratio of hours to minutes is 1 to 12. Now, if only there was a way to make things rotate at different speeds and specific ratios. Of course, I'm talking about gears. The way to make gears rotate at different speeds is to use a different number of teeth. Let's say gear A has 10 teeth and gear B has twice as many, that is 20 teeth. If you mesh them together, then gear B moves twice as fast as gear A, right? <laughs> Wrong, it's the other way around. The one with less teeth moves faster than the one with more teeth. Think about it this way. Each tooth engages with one tooth from the other gear. So if you advance one tooth on gear A, then you advance one tooth on gear B. But if you advance 10 teeth on gear A, the, then the gear has gone around one complete revolution, but you have only advanced 10 teeth on gear B, which has 20 teeth, so it has only gone halfway around. More teeth, slower rotation. 
So if we want the minute hand to go around 1 60th of a circle for every full turn of the second hand, then we need the minute hand to have 60 times more teeth than the second hand. And so let's say the gear for the second hand has six teeth, which is about as small as I'm willing to go. Then that means that the minute hand must have six times 60 teeth, which is 360 teeth. Oh, that is going to be pretty big. I'll first model the gears in Blender. You can follow along if you like, but if you really want to learn to use Blender properly, I recommend starting with Blender Guru's donut tutorial. Now Blender initiates with this default cube, which we don't need, so I'll get rid of it with X. To be able to make gears, we need to engage the add-on. Go to Edit, Preferences. In the pop-up window, find Add-ons and search for Add Mesh Extra Objects or just extra works. Activate this setting. Now we can create a gear. Hit Shift A, select Mesh, and then Gears and Gear. Boom. The first gear is that six tooth pinion, so let's change settings. Number of teeth, six. Radius, 0.04 meters. By the way, the ratio of teeth to radius should stay the same between all your gears and I'll adjust other settings as I see fit. So here it is. There's one other little thing. I want to rotate it by half a tooth so it'll mesh with the next gear. So that's a Z rotation of 30 degrees. Boom. Now let's add the next gear. Same process as before. The number of gears this time is going to be 360. To maintain the ratio of teeth to radius, we have to increase the radius by a factor of 60. That is 2.4 meters. That is much bigger. Adjust the base value to fill the gear wheel in a bit. And now we need to line the gears up properly. Selecting the small gear and moving it with GX will do the job. And now for the gear for the hour hand. That needs to have 12 times as many teeth as the minute hand. If we just base this off the big wheel, the next gear would need more than 4,000 teeth and would have a radius of almost 30 meters. And thankfully, there's a way around this. We'll just add a small gear that is coaxial with and locked to the big gear. And this new gear will have just 12 pins and will be much smaller. and we will raise it above the surface and rotate it by half a tooth. Now this is a much better gear to build the next gear ratio. The hour hand gear should need only 144 teeth. And I'll make it off camera by the same process. Oh, there it is. And I just need to move it aside to mesh with the previous gear. Now this clock needs hands. I'll keep them simple for the computer model, just basic rods. Again, we use Control A to bring up the Add menu. Select Curve and then Path. Now select the pinion. Right click, choose Snap, then Cursor is selected. This moves the cursor to the pinion. Now go back and select the path that you just created. Right click, choose Snap, then Selection to Cursor. This moves the path to the cursor, which is at the pinion. And we still can't really see this path, so let's give it some definition. In the path options, change the bevel depth to 0.01 meters. And I'll, later I'll widen this to 0.02. And now we can see this thing. Rotate it by 90 degrees. Let's chop it in half. To do that, go to edit mode, select the lower points, and delete them. And just copy and paste the second hand to create the minute hands. And a little shortening may be called for.
Add the hour hand and the basic model is done. It just needs a splash of color. And give me a moment. Yeah, that'll do. And now for the mechanics. By the way, I normalized the positions and rotations of all the gears before this step. So we want to link the hands to their respective gears so they rotate together. This can be done by simple parenting. Select the hand, then shift select the gear. P opens the parenting menu and select object. And we'll do this for each of the hands. Now to get the gears to rotate together. For this, we'll set up a mathematical link between their rotations. Select the big gear for the minute hand. Right click the Z rotation in the item menu and choose add driver. Now to modify the driver, we'll program in an expression. We want this to turn at 160 at the rate of the second hand, so we type minus var divided by 60 in the expression box. Now to set the target. In the object setting, set the object to the pinion. And we are linking the z-axis rotations, so type to z-rotation. Now we repeat the process for the hour hand gear, connecting it to the minute hand gear with the expression minus var divided by 12. Now when I rotate the second hand, both the minute and the hour hands rotate along with it. So let's set up an animation to let the second hand rotate around a bunch of times. Click on the animation window. And we'll just set up a couple of simple keyframes and it'll fill in the rest. With the pinion selection, we go to timeline and select rotation keyframes. I sets the keyframe at the current setting. And now we have the first keyframe set. We also want the animation to go for a while, so change the end frame to, um, let's say, 3000. That'll do. Go to that last frame. Change the pinion rotation to minus 108,000. So minus degrees is clockwise rotation. And set the keyframe with I. Start the animation. Notice the motion and the gears are meshing all right. And let's zoom in a little bit and see that the gear teeth are interlocking properly as the gears rotate. But there's a problem. The minute hand is moving backwards. That's because of the way the gears mesh. Adjacent gears move in opposite directions. If we want the minute hand to move clockwise, we have to add another gear. Now, if we want to move it at the same speed, it would need to be another 362 gear, but that's gonna make this whole thing even bigger. Or we could replace the 362 gear with two smaller gears. I went ahead and did that off camera. Here's all the tooth counts of the gears. The first set is 6 to 60, or 1 to 10. The second is 12 to 72, or 1 to 6. So the combination of gears gives us the required gear reduction of 1 to 60. And similarly, the gears between the minute hand and the hour hand combine to give the 1 to 12 reduction. So let's see the gears in action. So now the minute hand is going clockwise as it should. Now let's build this gear train for realsies. I exported the gear designs from Blender into Tinkercad, which I find easier for constructing printable models. I then added axles and a frame to hold it all together, and now we can print the parts. So I went ahead and printed it, and here's all the parts. Hey, come back here. I 
I'm using wooden dowels for the axles and small popsicle sticks for the hands. This is, after all, just a demonstration model. It doesn't have to be pretty. Assembly is fairly straightforward. For now, I'll just use sticky tape to hold it together. The second hand just slots into place. About the minute and hour hands are held on with double sticky tape. Okay, now let's test it. It works! Hey, let's advance it a full hour. Notice that the minute hand has circled all the way around, but the hour hand has advanced by one twelfth of the circle. That is exactly what it should do. So I think this was a great start. We have the clock hands all moving like they should. Now we could leave it like this, but most clocks have all the hands rotating along a common axis. And that is going to be a problem that we're going to tackle next time. Now following that, we'll also start to look at the mechanism to rotate the gears on their own and to help them keep on the right time. Now, this project is not sponsored by the Vatican Observatory, but for full disclosure, I should mention I make use of their facilities and resources for video editing and such. The purpose of the Vatican Observatory is to be a sign to the world of the compatibility of faith and science and of the Church's support of science, and it could use your support. If you would like to support the work of the Vatican Observatory, or even just to learn a little bit more about it, there is a link in the description. Please check it out. By the way, because of the imminent arrival of OSIRIS-REx and my involvement in the sample analysis program, there may be a gap of a few months between videos for a while. Please be patient and make sure that you have activated the notifications so you will be informed as soon as the next video drops. I still have several projects on the back burner, so there will be no lack of videos in the future. This includes footage of the final build and installation of the pycnometer and the OSIRIS-REx sample analysis itself. Now, the Zero Knowledge Clock project will come in installments, but I hope to have the whole clock finished within a reasonable amount of time. So, until the next video, peace.